John McMullen. His appearance is brought to you by Harris Resort, Bally's Atlantic City, Wild Wild West. They're taking bets at the sports book. Wager today at the book. Gambling problem, 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, John, as the Eagles get ready for a uh, Minnesota Vikings team that they obviously know pretty well. Both these teams are uh, kind of at a crossroads in their season. The, the lo- a loss for either one of these teams p- makes an interesting uh, – <laughs> puts them in an interesting spot. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think, you know, the NFL season, as we always talk about, people tend to overreact from week to week. Uh, and if the loser of this game, there's going to be a ton of overreaction in that particular city, even though the season's far from over for both uh, because you have division games and there's an opportunity to make some hay there uh, for each of them. But you're right. Uh, people are going to overreact, whoever loses this game, and that particular organization is going to have to deal with it. Um, the Eagles, uh, you wrote a story about this, uh, and I look at the um, did-not-participate list. Derek Barnett, Corey Clement, Fletcher Cox, Alshon Jeffrey, Darren Sproles. Uh, these aren't minor names. Uh, are any of them minor issues? Uh, well, I, I think – uh, a couple of them are minor issues. Corey Clement with the quad. I mean, Doug called that precautionary. Uh, if you if you remember during the game with Tennessee, Fletcher left, I think, for one play with that ankle injury. And I really tend to think it, it's more of a load management thing at this time because he's playing so many snaps. Uh, they probably wanted to give him a day off. Uh, Guys like Alshon and and Derek Barnett, we didn't even know they were hurt. And Doug's certainly not giving us that information before practice. So we show up and they're not on the field. And it's a new injury for Alshon Jeffrey. It's not the shoulder. It's not the illness. It's not the virus. It's the chest. And with Derek Barnett, it's the shoulder. So all you can do is wait and see how it it sort of starts to unveil during the week and see if these guys are going to be ready to play. I I would say Fletcher, I think, is going to play, and I think that's more of a load management thing. I saw him in the locker room. He saw completely, completely fine. Uh, Generally, when players are hurt, they don't come into the open portion of the locker room. I did not see Derek Barnett or Alshon Jeffrey, so just from that indication, that could be a little bit more serious. Yeah, and I see it's uh, listed as Alshon Jeffrey chest. It does have does that have anything to do with the surgery he had, uh, which is like a lumbar, uh, like a uh, labrum area? No, it doesn't. And that's what I was saying. It's a different injury. So and it, and it just kind of propped up out of nowhere. We didn't know that that happened during the game. So that's something you have to keep an eye on uh, if he's able to practice this week at all. Uh, also, um, let's go to Sproles, who. You know, the hamstring, we know those things are tricky, but he's an older guy. I mean, is there starting to get some concern that maybe they can't count on Sproles even when he does return? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be concerning because if he doesn't play again this week, that's four games, and he's important to this offense. Uh, And you saw it in Tennessee, the fact that he's such a good pass protector on third down, uh, and, and they really struggled with that against the Titans. Now, part of it was that Corey Clement was also out, so you had your two top pass protectors on third down in the backfield not able to play, so you were down to number three, which is Wendell Smallwood. I I think the hope is that if Darren is still unable to go, Corey will be able to go, so at least you should have some improvement from that perspective. You know, um, and Doug Peterson spoke today. We'll get into some of the things that he had to say at his press conference. And one of the things it seemed like, uh, you know, he's kind of stressing that maybe the team doesn't have a sense of urgency. Are you uh, on the same page with him as that? Well, I think that's Super Bowl hangover stuff. I think that's human nature. We've been talking about it since the offseason, and and it did. And uh, Doug talked about it a little bit yesterday. I think that is something to bet that bears watching uh, because it, it's almost it's almost a subconscious thing. It's not like you, you understand you go to work. You understand how difficult it is to win in this league. Veteran players do. 
Uh, but then, as I said, there's that human nature aspect that if things get tough and, and you sort of say, you know what, we already won one. That's just that's what it is. And everybody deals with it. Everybody who wins deals with it. And that's why it's so impressive what the New England Patriots have, have been able to do over a long period of time. Right. Because it is it is subconscious and it doesn't matter what you say to yourself. You have that piece of jewelry in the box, and there's some satisfaction there. And I, I don't know how you deal with it. So what, what, I do you, think, what do you make of what's happening in Minnesota then, where this team fell short? But you would almost think that getting Cousins was like a shot of life in the arm to that team. I don't know how many people. Maybe they liked Keenum. I don't know. But I, I would feel that, that people thought he was the weak link. Yeah, I mean, I, I I talked about this in the off season as well. I, I expected Minnesota to be a good team, uh, but not be as good win wise as they were under Case Keenum. But I expected Kirk Cousins to play well. Too often in this league, people boil down victory and loss to quarterback play. Now it's it's extremely important, but if it were everything, I got news for you: the Vikings would be. 3-0-1 or 4-0. Because Kirk Cousins has played great. Right. It's other issues. The defense has completely fallen off a cliff. They have no running game. They're 32nd in the NFL. They have the worst offensive line in the NFL. He's the last person you're going to blame this on. If you do want to criticize him for something, uh, it's, it's the strip sacks and the fumbles. And, and that part of it, because he's he's had an issue with that dating back to his time in Washington when he had a good offensive line. Uh, and now that he's got a bad offensive line, it's becoming more of an issue. John McMullen, at JF McMullen. Give him a follow on Twitter, of course, here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline as uh, the Eagles getting ready for a Minnesota Vikings team that has a lot of weapons, John. Diggs, Thielen, uh, Cook, who hasn't been quite as explosive as he was as a rookie last year, but they've got weapons. As you mentioned, Cousins is having a fantastic year, So, and, and we'll get to the offensive line issues. But the way the Eagles have been playing defense, is this a concerning test up against this Vikings offense? Or, hey, they're home. Why should we worry? Uh, I think the latter. I mean, they are completely different at home versus the road. Uh, but, yeah, I, I mean, look, these receivers are great, and, and they run routes like nobody else, and they're going to get separation. So you got to go about it a different way, and, and that's what the Eagles were able to do in the NFC Championship game. They were helped out by the fact that Dillon was hurt. He's going to be healthy uh, coming into this game. But uh, the fact is you cannot uh, let the quarterback get comfortable uh, because if if they have time to throw the football, they're going to hurt you. Uh, but the good news is they don't have time to throw the football more often than not. And with the Eagles' defensive line against that offensive line, it, it doesn't bode well for Minnesota. How do you see um, – the Eagles don't move their guys. So – uh, Mills and Darby against Thielen and Diggs. Uh, how do you see that? Well, it, it's pick your poison, even if you want to move them. Uh, Stefan's a little bit more explosive, uh, but Thielen is just, you know, one of the best technicians. I, I think people don't realize he runs a 4 4 as well. Uh, he's a big guy. I think people don't realize that. He's 6 2. He's got strong hands. He does everything well so he's the more well-rounded guy uh Diggs is the more explosive guy and they're both really really good they sure are uh and it's an interesting like you we, when when we look at the Eagles secondary of course uh they win the Super Bowl and their secondary was such a surprise last year that we enter in saying man secondary is really good that's the strength of the team and now it's turned into a little bit of a question mark. But, but I, I think mostly the question mark for me, I don't know about you, John, comes from that McLeod spot. That's what I'm more worried about that spot moving forward than I am Mills. Yeah, you know, I, it, it's funny. I was talking about Josh off the air. Normally, I, I think if you, if you talked about this type of injury, uh, forget about five, I said five years ago to Josh, really last year, 
I think it would be more concerning. Uh, I think because of the changes in the game, I think one of the reasons Devontae Maddox is, is been moved, has been moved back to safety is because you can move him back to safety now because it is about coverage. You don't have to worry about uh, run support as much. You don't have to worry about an intimidating presence in the middle of the field uh, because it, it doesn't exist. Uh, so in a weird way, I think as the season goes on, I think you'll, you'll have better coverage because you have a cornerback playing safety. And ultimately, I think the entire league is going to trend this way with just tons of coverage guys on the back end. So in some ways, I think the Eagles are going to be ahead of the curve. Yeah, I mean, and look, when they came to training camp, they had a plethora of guys. You throw Rasul Douglas. What, do you have one snap last week? Uh, I don't think Rasul had any, but he's been getting one or two. And it's uh, that is a concern. You have to wonder yourself. You have to wonder what's going on there. Uh, and part of it is that Jim Schwartz, look, Jim Schwartz likes Jalen Mills as a player. I, I know fans don't understand that, but he's got tremendous confidence in him. Uh, Ronald Darby is this team's best corner. We know about the ceiling of, of Sidney Jones as a player. Uh, so really, I mean, Rasul is the number four guy. The, the questions are raised when you do need help at safety and you move Avante Maddox back there before Rasul Douglas. And then you start to raise your eyebrows a little bit, but I think a lot of it is just what I explained. Right. It, it, typically, we, we talk about, well, you need a safety, so you need a big guy, and that's what Rasul is. But Jim Jim's feeling is, no, you need a coverage guy, and that's why Avante's back there. And to be honest, uh, I'm probably wrong, and Jim Schwartz is probably right uh, <laughs> with the way the NFL is going. So it's hard for me to admit that, but – I'm sure <laughs> well, I mean, and I think one of the things we try to do uh, sometimes as fans, but you're trying to Rubik's Cube the current personnel and figure out who fits where the best if you, you know, can't get help outside, which I don't think they can. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six. I got about six guys, and there's two spots on, on the field that, you know, could be affected. Do I play Corey Graham for well, 70 yeah. snaps, or do I try to Rubik's Cube somebody else into that spot? Well, and Jim said that's probably not tenable long term. You probably can't play a 33-year-old guy 71 snaps a week. So I'm glad he admitted I that. Do think, yeah, I do think you're going to see more and more work for Avante Maddox in that position. Which I think, John, would forward. be the guy that people would have uh, seen – the least likely to move into that spot. Well, and that's and I agree with you, and that's where I said I was wrong. I was in that group as well, and I'm probably wrong. And I, I, I talked about this with Ryan a little bit yesterday. That's what, I mean, people, and I put myself in this category, I'm not insulting people, but people live in the past. And, you know, when you say Minnesota's a good team, no, they're not. They were a good team last year. That's how quickly this league moves. Uh, when you talk about Avante Maddox, are they not just not good? Are they just not good because their lines that bad, or do they have problems on defense too? That you know, I saw their defensive numbers have been not very good. Um, so is it just a full, is it a full team? Uh, I don't want to say collapse, but the offensive line we already know is bad. Is their defense a problem too? Yeah, their defense has been terrible. Now they have more talent on the defensive side of the ball, so there's a hope uh, that they can get some of the issues corrected. Uh, defensively, it's been a lack of communication, which is kind of weird because they've been in the same scheme. Uh, they've had a lot of the same players, uh, and most of those players are still in the prime of their careers. It's not a bunch of old guys. So there is hope they can turn that part of it around, but they've given up just a, a boatload of explosive plays. Uh, so the defense has been every bit as bad as the offense. I mean, let's be honest, in a normal game, if you saw the Vikings uh, on Thursday night, a lot of people did against the Rams, in a normal game, Kirk Cousins did plenty, more than plenty, to win a football game. But the defense just absolutely could not stop Jared Goff. Uh, so plenty of the blame goes on that side of the football as well. But they do have talent. Uh, the, the bigger problem is the offensive line because they just don't have guys who can play on the offensive line. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not sure I'm not sure how you fix that. In 
a league, I said, John, earlier, the, the NFL is like the SATs. Just for showing up, you get like 700 points for putting your name on it. You show up with like seven points on the board, right? When you when these games oh, start, oh. when when these games yeah. starts, teams are starting with 200 yards and seven points on the board. How are the Eagles struggling to score? Well, I, I mean, you, we talk about. I, I mean, you just said the Vikings have an awful offensive line, yet still we're going up and down the field and able to score a ton of points. Yeah, and that says something also when people say how good the Rams are. You also have to add that in the equation. Well, the Rams are really good offensively, not so much defensively, uh, especially now that Aqib Tlaib is out. They certainly have Aaron Donald and Adamic and Sue, but you need more than that, uh, and, and that kind of showed up. Uh, but generally what this league is, you're going to get a lot of yardage. The Eagles have gotten a lot of yardage. Uh, and then it comes down to, really, when are the penalties and the negative plays going to come? And if you have too many penalties and negative plays uh, in, in key situations, that's going to affect your scoring uh, more than anything else. Whereas if you play a clean game, which is very, very difficult to do, then you get those huge numbers. Uh, you wrote about Timmy Jernigan today. Any uh, optimistic feels around him? No, no optimism whatsoever. Uh, it's it's one of those, you know, Doug has taken this tact with injuries. He doesn't give us much, and, and he doesn't put timetables on anybody, and he doesn't put people in boxes. And the reality is he's on the NFI list, so he's out to week seven minimum. At that point, he could be activated if, if he's medically cleared. Then the Eagles would have 21 days to decide if they wanted him and to, wanted to add him to the 53-man roster. Sounds like they don't think he's going to be ready week seven. Uh, and then you start talking about later in the season, later in the season. Uh, I, you never say never because Sidney Jones actually came back really late. But I don't think you're going to be seeing Tim Jernigan anytime soon. Let's mm. put it that way. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he was asked about him today. He just kind of gave you a one-word almost answer on that. And, and uh, do you think he's a the guy they're missing? I mean, is he part of the defense oh, yeah. that they're lacking, more so than uh, McLeod? Yeah, I, I mean, we always talk about their rotation and how good it is, and it is at defensive end. It is not a defensive tackle this year, and that's because Tim hasn't been there. Uh, and really, you had a really good three-man rotation Last year with Fletcher, uh, Tim Jernigan, and Bo Allen, two of them are gone. Tim, because of the back surgery, Bo's in Tampa Bay. Uh, and Destiny Vallejo hasn't stepped up. Haloti Nada hasn't played as well as I thought he would. Uh, maybe he starts uh, playing a little bit better as a two-down player. And that forces you to move Brandon Graham and, and, and Michael Bennett inside maybe more than you want to. Uh but I think ultimately that's the way the Eagles have to go if they want to limit Fletcher Cox. And we're already we're already at week five, and we're already talking load management with Fletcher Cox because he's playing Chip Kelly numbers. That's how many snaps he's playing. Yeah, it's like he's on a Chip Kelly defense. Yeah, <laughs> and and that's not going to work out. That's not going to work out well long term. Jim Jim knows that he said it. Uh, but how do you take him off the field? It, it, that's your best player. That's your, your best player. If you're going to rate the Eagles from 1 through 53, number one is Fletcher Cox. How do you take him off the field for Destiny Vallejo in key situations? Hmm. Answer is he can't, uh, and that's really difficult. Now, you're always going to be uh, a lesser when he's not on the field, but if it's a Tim Jernigan type uh, paired with Hello Dinana, you feel a little bit better. Eagles don't have that right now. John, uh, in the NFC East, uh, you know, there's a game for Philly that they're playing Minnesota. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's not a gimme, but you obviously sound like you like them playing at home. Washington's got a shot here to get to 3-1. and one. Uh, Dallas can get to 3-2. and two. Is there a team in the East that you think has staying power that can make it interesting? Yeah, I think Washington is is the second best team. I thought that for a while. Um, I think Alex Smith knows how to win in this league. That's that's borne out over many many years. If you look at his his record as a starting quarterback since 
the the light sort of turned on for him in San Francisco, it's it's really impressive. I mean, he just wins games. Uh, you can talk about the playoffs and saying he hasn't been able to to push it through, and that's fine. But he's getting to the playoffs, yeah. and he's done it a lot. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, it, I mentioned their offensive line. Uh, it's one of the best in football, top five. Uh, and they also, I, I like, they're not big names, but I like their receiving course. I, I, everybody knows Jordan Reed. When he's healthy, he's difficult to deal with. But if you look at Josh Doxson and, and Paul Richardson and Jamison Crowder, they fit together perfectly. That's what the that's what the Eagles were looking for with Mike Wallace. They have Paul Richardson, who can run past everybody. They have a great slot receiver and Crowder, and they got the big lengthy guy. and And that's what the Eagles were trying to duplicate, but it hasn't worked out because of the injuries. All right, John McMullen. Of course, you can hear him tomorrow night with uh, Mosher McMullen and Krause. Uh, six to eight from the landmark in Glassboro. Check them out every Thursday night. The show's getting big out there. And uh, six o'clock start time right after us here on the Sports Bash. John, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Thank you, John. Hey, thanks,